In its simplest form, the oath of Omerta that binds all made men means two things. Number one, never rat out your friends or even enemies. And number two, always keep your mouth shut. It is common knowledge that anyone who fails to adhere to this code risks bringing hell down on themselves. But not everyone knows the extreme lengths the mob is willing to go to punish what they deem to be the greatest sin. In today's video, I will be revealing what happened to members of the mob who snitched. 4. Michael Mikey Scars Di Leonardo after his June 2002 arrest, Michael DiLeonardo managed to put more mobsters behind bars than even the most famous mafia informant. Michael DiLeonardo was born on June 18, 1955, to second-generation immigrants, and from his humble beginnings, he went on to become one of the most consequential informants in mafia history. At the time of Michael's birth, his father was a horse player while his mother was a seamstress. Michael and his siblings were raised in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, in a predominantly Italian neighborhood, and it was here he earned the nickname Mikey scars. The nickname was in reference to a facial scar he got after being bitten by a dog. Like many other made men, Di Leonardo was introduced to the world of crime at a relatively young age. His paternal grandfather was a captain in the Daquila crime family, which would later become known as the Gambino crime family. So it was not uncommon for young Di Leonardo to meet and mingle with members of the mafia. By the time he became a teenager, Di Leonardo had joined some street gangs and had begun running errands for several Gambino associates who gave him tips for his services. In 1970, De Leonardo graduated from New Utrecht High School at the age of 18, and then he proceeded to attend college for 18 months. Unfortunately, he did not graduate. By the time he turned 21, De Leonardo had started working for the Gambino family, but had not officially been inducted. He was engaged in tasks like vandalization and assault, and it didn't take long for him to develop an interest in other mafia-related ventures like loan sharking and gambling. As the years rolled by, De Leonardo took up an active role in the Gambino family's gambling operations and all seemed to be going smoothly until the late 70s when he got arrested for promoting gambling in a Las Vegas casino. At this time, the police had no idea of the crimes De Leonardo would go on to commit, so they let him off with a $50 fine. After being let off with a slap on the wrist, De Leonardo returned to his life of crime, and he began to gain influence as an associate. In 1980, he opened a social club which he used as the headquarters for his illegal bookmaking, loan sharking, and gambling operations. He was also known to host powerful members of the Gambino family, like Salvatore, Sammy the Bull Gravano, and Frank DeSico. Five years after he opened up his social club, Di Leonardo married Antoinette Tony Marie Fapiano, a cousin of Gambino underboss Frank DeSico, further strengthening his position within the organization, although the two eventually got divorced. As time passed, leadership positions within the Gambino family passed from one made man to another, and through it all, Di Leonardo continued to maintain his illegal operations. He continued growing up the ranks, forming new partnerships, and starting new businesses. During this time, he participated in various crimes ranging from racketeering and conspiracy to commit murder to loan sharking and extortion. After proving to be an asset, De Leonardo was formally inducted into the Gambino family on December 24, 1988, becoming a made man under the leadership of John Gotti. Now a formal part of the organization, De Leonardo had the clearance to perform more sensitive tasks, and he had access to the higher-ups. While speaking in court, he said the day he became a made man was indeed a proud moment in his life then. Under Gotti's supervision, De Leonardo would go on to play a major role in the murder of Fred Weiss. Fred Weiss was a business owner who had done business with Gotti and the Gambino family at some point, and so, when Weiss was arrested, Gotti feared that he would testify against a Gambino soldier. Driven by his fear, Gotti ordered De Leonardo to arrange for Weiss to be eliminated. Following the arrest and subsequent conviction of John J. Gotti, De Leonardo was promoted to captain. His new position came with new responsibilities, so he was put in charge of the Gambino family's construction and trucking rackets. Around this time, De Leonardo became a close associate of Junior Gotti, and together the pair committed numerous crimes, including stock market fraud, murder, and extortion. De Leonardo's operations persisted until September 2000, when he was indicted on racketeering, extortion, and money laundering charges, after surrendering willfully. The reasons for his willful surrender remain unknown, however. What the world knows is that he was put on trial in the Atlanta Federal Court with high sentencing guidelines of about 20 years and more. Despite the fact that he surrendered willfully, De Leonardo was in no way ready to pay for his crimes, so he pleaded not guilty to the charges. Four months later, on August 30, 2001, he was acquitted by a jury. Although not found guilty by the jury, Michael was very well guilty of the crimes he was charged with, and he would go on to commit several more after regaining his freedom. Unfortunately for De Leonardo, his freedom did not last. In June 2002, he was arrested and indicted again for labor racketeering, extortion, witness tampering, 
loan sharking and the murder of Fred Weiss. Seeing how this wasn't his first run-in with the law, De Leonardo was somewhat confident that he would beat the judicial system yet again. Unknown to him, the worst was yet to come. While De Leonardo was awaiting trial, the Gambino crime family suddenly stopped all money going to him and his family on the grounds that he was stealing from them. In response to the allegations brought against him, De Leonardo sent out several messages declaring his innocence and prompting the family for support, all to no avail. I started getting really angry. One message I sent out, well, probably one of the last ones I sent out, was, uh, tell those guys I don't remember dying and I don't remember get, getting life. I may come home one day. Despite De Leonardo's attempts, the Gambino family had made a decision. They turned their backs on him and shelved him. For a made man like Michael, being put on the shelf means he was stripped of his rank as captain and had lost all privileges associated with being a member of the Gambino family. Upon receiving the news, Michael felt betrayed and crushed, and this eventually led him to testify against the Gambino family. After making the decision to cooperate with the government, De Leonardo supposedly became heartbroken to the point that the thought of betraying his former best friend, Judy Junior Gotti, combined with his own son's disapproval of his choice, drove him to attempt suicide. Notwithstanding, he went on to provide damning evidence against the mob. De Leonardo's testimonies led to 80 successful convictions, and among the affected individuals were high-ranking mobsters like Peter Gotti, Junior Gotti, Louis Big Lou Valerio, Frank Fapiano, Richard V. Gotti, Richard G. Gotti, and Michael Yanotti. Away from the Gambino crime family where he belonged, De Leonardo also testified against high-ranking mobsters of other families such as the Colombo crime family acting boss Alphonse Persico and underboss John Jackie de Ross. Eventually, they were both convicted and sentenced to prison. De Leonardo's record as an informant is regarded as unprecedented as he testified a total of 15 times to this date. No other made mafia member has even come close. In exchange for being an informant, De Leonardo was given a lenient sentence, and so on September September 19, 2011, he was sentenced to time already served in prison and released from confinement. Currently, De Leonardo and his second family are in the Federal Witness Protection Program under disguised names. On the surface, it appears that the betrayal by the Gambino family propelled De Leonardo to snitch on the mob and become a high-level government informant. From this perspective, many argue that had he not been betrayed, he would not have gone down that road. Others, however, believe that he should have upheld the oath of Omerta regardless of the circumstances. Whichever the case, it goes without saying that the consequence of De Leonardo's betrayal is that he and his family will spend the rest of their lives looking over their shoulders. 3. Jimmy the Weasel, Fradiano. Jimmy, who was the first person you killed? Mm, Frankie Nicoli. Where'd you kill him? In my house. How'd you kill him? We strangled him. In your own living room? Right. During his life, Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano was a writer, a husband, and a father, but he was also one of the most effective and brutal mobsters in the Mafia. Born in Naples, Italy on November 14, 1913, Fratiano's parents made the decision to relocate to an Italian neighborhood in Cleveland when he was only an infant. According to several accounts, Fratiano turned to crime at a very young age. By the time he was one, he had ventured into gambling, and when he turned 17, he had become an equal partner in the gambling operation he was a part of. Being on the wrong side of the law, Fratiano began to have run-ins with the law during his teenage years. It was during one of these clashes with a police officer that he earned the nickname The Weasel for attempting to make his getaway on foot. When Fratiano turned 20, he had done a fine job of climbing his way up the criminal ladder in Cleveland, and although he had been arrested more than once, he had managed to get off the hook time and time again. Unfortunately for him, his luck ran out in 1937 when he was convicted of robbery and made to spend a little over seven years in an Ohio state prison. After being released on parole, Fratiano moved to Los Angeles, California. It was there that he became a member of the mafia organization of Dragna, Licata, and E. Brooklier. Now an active member of the mob, Fratiano began to earn a name for himself in the criminal underworld. He also began to build complex networks and amass global connections. Among Fratiano's associates were powerful crime figures like Mickey Cohen, Murray Riley, and Bella Chide. Like with many other made men, Fratiano's growing reputation and status in the mob came with intermittent jail periods and trial convictions. Between 1951 and 1973, he was arrested several times and jailed. In 1951, he was brought in on suspicions of conspiracy to commit murder, but was later released. About three years later, in 1954, he was convicted of attempted extortion and sentenced to over six years in prison. After his release from prison, Fratiano managed to avoid clashes with law enforcement and the judicial system for a while. But in 1968, he had another run-in with the law. In court, he pleaded guilty to charges stemming from phony pay agreements 
agreements with drivers at a trucking company he owned. In 1971, Fratiano entered yet another guilty plea, only this time he had been charged with extortion. Despite the fact that he was in and out of prison, Fratiano continued to make his way up the ranks in the Dragna, Licata, and Brooklier organization. And so after the then boss of the Los Angeles family, Dominic Brooklier, was imprisoned, he became acting boss alongside Louis Tom Dragna. Although Fratiano's stint as co-acting boss was short because Dominic Brooklier took back the position after being released, it was filled with controversies. In the short while that he held the position, Fratiano landed himself in hot water with some members of the organization. At one point, he was accused of treachery and of running a separate faction of the family. As time passed, Fratiano's situation grew all the more precarious thanks to a series of situations and events, the first of which was the arrest of Ferrito, a well-known soldier who was affiliated with both the Cleveland and Los Angeles crime families. The climax of it all came when Ferrito turned government informant after learning that his former boss had ordered his assassination. Ferrito's confession led to the indictment of Jimmy Fratiano on charges related to the bombing and murder of Irish mob boss Danny Green, who was also an FBI informant. Now in custody as well, Fratiano was consumed by the same fear that had driven Ferrito, and so he too turned government witness. Some sources, however, claim that Fratiano had been cooperating with the FBI prior to that and that he made the decision to do so on his own. In exchange for his cooperation, Fratiano received a five-year prison sentence even after pleading guilty to multiple murder charges. He would go on to serve 21 months of the sentence after which he entered into the Federal Witness Protection Program. Although Ferrito's testimony led to the indictment of over 15 members of the Cleveland crime family, it was Fratiano that would come to be known as one of the most valuable informants the FBI had turned to date. As an influential figure in the criminal underworld, Fratiano had valuable information that proved vital on more than one occasion. One such occasion was when he informed the authorities of Roselli's role in selling the Desert Inn to Howard Hughes and his part in the CIA's Operation Mongoose. While still in witness protection, Fratiano made the most out of his newfound career as a talker, collaborating on two books, The Last Mafioso and Vengeance is Mine. After about a decade, the Justice Department decided to remove Fratiano from the payroll of the government's witness protection program on the grounds that he had received about a million dollars in the last 10 years. After learning about this decision, Fratiano did not hide his displeasure, especially because he believed that the government was abandoning him at a time when the $100,000 contract he claimed the mafia put out on him was still active. Despite being kicked out of Witsec, Fratiano went on to live a relatively long life, and unlike many of his peers, he died as a result of natural causes at age 80 in 1993. At first glance, it appears as though Fratiano snitched on the mob and went scot-free, but while speaking in an interview, he himself confirmed that during his time in Witsec, living alone and staying away from his family was truly disheartening. 2. Abe Kid Twist Relis dubbed the canary who could sing but couldn't fly, many believe Abraham Relis's fate should serve as an example to all Mafia members who may have considered betraying their underworld colleagues at one point or another. Regarded as one of the most prolific assassins in the mob's history, Relis becoming an informant shook the annals of the Mafia to a standstill. Born in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn on May 10, 1906, Abraham Relis was the child of Jewish immigrants. By every indication, the family lived from hand to mouth, and at one point, Relis's father was known for selling finger food on the streets. Despite his family's economic status, Relis's parents tried to give him an education. He, however, ended up dropping out in the eighth grade. After leaving school, Relis began to hang out in all the wrong places, and he soon became associated with the gangs in the streets of Brownsville. It was during this time that he met and befriended Martin Bugsy Goldstein and Harry Pittsburgh Phil Strauss. The two would eventually climb up the ranks with him in the organized crime group known as Murder Incorporated. Before becoming affiliated with Murder, Inc. Relesi and his friends started out as petty thieves in their teenage years. In 1921, when he was only 15, Rels was arrested for the first time and was made to spend four months at the Children's Village at Dobbs Ferry, New York. After being released, Relis quickly returned to his life of crime, and together with his friend Goldstein, he began working for the Shapiro brothers, who at the time were leaders of a group of Jewish-American mobsters. Working for the Shapiro brothers entailed carrying out a series of petty crimes, and so it didn't take long before Relis was arrested 
arrested again. This time he was sentenced to two years in an upstate New York juvenile institution, and to his dismay, the Shapiro brothers did nothing to help him. After serving his time, Reyles came out determined to get his revenge, so he started his own operation on the Shapiro brothers' territory after seeking protection from a more influential crime, Lord Meyer Lansky. As you can imagine, Reel's actions incurred the wrath of the Shapiro brothers, and so they began to make plans to assassinate him and his partners. The battle line had been drawn, and both parties were willing to do whatever it took. In 1933, while still at odds with the Shapiro brothers, Relis became a member of Murder Incorporated. At the time that Relis joined the crime group, Murder Incorporated served as the enforcement arm of the National Crime Syndicate, and they specialized in carrying out contract killings. When it came to committing murder crimes, Relis's weapon of choice was an ice pick. He would take the kitchen implement and ram it through his victim's ear right into the brain. After what one can only assume to be years of practice, Relis became so adept at using the ice pick that many of his murder victims were thought to have died of a cerebral hemorrhage. While some assassins are known to kill as a way to earn a living, Reles seemed to enjoy his profession, so much so that he came to be known as a psychopath killer. Although they may have been exaggerated, some accounts report that he turned to murder for the flimsiest of reasons. One time he allegedly killed a parking lot attendant for failing to fetch his car fast enough, and another time he attacked a worker at a car wash because said worker failed to clean a smudge on the fender of his car. Aside from his occupation as a serial murderer, Relis was known to be a bootlegger. He also ventured into loan sharking, crap games, and labor slugging. Year in and year out, Relis continued his operations, and soon he became one of Brooklyn's top assassins. As he was still a member of Murder Incorporated, he answered to Racket's boss Louis Lepka Bucalter and worked for other influential crime bosses like Meyer Lansky. He was slowly making his way up the ladder, but it all came crashing down when in 1940 he was arrested for a string of murders. Relis was no stranger to life behind bars, but this time it was different. If convicted, he would most likely face execution. After weighing his options, the once bloodthirsty mobster decided to become a government informant, implicating his boss, other highly organized crime figures of the Costa Nostra, and even his close and childhood friend, Bugsy Goldstein. As an informant, Reyles provided valuable information on Murder, Inc.'s methods and operations. He spoke extensively on the group's relationship to the American Mafia and dished out details that helped law enforcement close as many as 70, 70 unsolved murders. Thanks to Reyles's testimony, many influential figures in the criminal underworld, including his former boss, Lepke Bucalter, were convicted and executed. Following Bucalter's conviction, Albert Anastasia, an Italian-American mobster who was said to be the co-chief of operations of Murder, Inc., was next in line. Albert Anastasia's trial, which was based solely on Reyes's testimony, was set to take place on November 12, 1941. But on the morning of that fateful day, things took a chaotic turn. Seeing how vengeful the mob can be, the authorities placed Reyes in witness protection shortly after he became an informant. In the days leading up to Anastasia's trial, he was hidden away at the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island under the watchful eyes of several detectives, but as it turns out, even that couldn't save him. In the early hours of November 12, 1941, with several policemen standing guard at the door, Reyes fell to his death from a window in room 623. As you would expect, the incident caused a lot of speculation and controversies. While one school of thought believed that the Mafia had somehow infiltrated the hotel and killed Reyes, others were of the opinion that he died trying to make an escape through the window. And that's I depended on Raleigh's as that, the independent. And that's group. why he was locked up in the hotel to hold him, was that it? Not for that one case alone, but that is why he was in the hotel. And are you not familiar with the facts about his death? I am. And what's your version of it? That he tried to escape. Despite the fact that in 1951, a grand jury came to the conclusion that Reles died accidentally during his attempted escape, the truth about what really happened to the canary who could sing but couldn't fly will forever remain a mystery. To this day, his unusual death continues to serve as an example of the horrible fate that often befalls those who snitch on the mob. 1. Salvatore, Sammy the Bull, Gravano. They have said you are the single most important witness ever to testify against the mob? I think I am. An underboss is the highest position who's ever cooperated. Salvatore Gravano was born on the 12th of March, 1945, to Italian immigrants Giorlando Jerry and Caterina K. Gravano. He was the youngest of three children, and unlike many members of the Mafia, he had a good standard of living throughout his childhood. As a child, Gravano battled with dyslexia, and because of this, he struggled to fit in at school. He was picked on by other students so much so that he turned to anger and violence as outlets for his frustration. It didn't take long for young Gravano to add crime to the mix, and so by the time he was 13, he had joined a youth 
youth gang called the Rampers. Together with his gang members, Gravano began to take part in burglaries and car theft. Finally, at the age of 16, he left school for good. In 1964, when he was around 19 years old, Gravano was drafted into the military. He served in Fort Jackson working as a mess hall cook, and from there he rose to the rank of a corporal before being honorably discharged a few years later. Gravano lived predominantly in Bensonhurst, the consolidated area for the Colombo crime family, and since being in the military had done nothing to quell his criminal tendencies, he quickly fell in with the wrong crowd after home. One of the people that Gravano was associating with at this point was Anthony Sparrow, a young man whose uncle Shorty was an associate of the Colombo family. Through this connection, Gravano became affiliated to the crime family, and he soon became a part of their illegal operations, which ranged from larceny and hijacking to armed robbery and loan sharking. Within a short while, Gravano managed to warm his way into the heart of Joe Colombo, who was a boss at the time. Joe took notice of Gravano because the youngster proved to be efficient with handling tasks, regardless of the assignment he was given. Sam Sammy the Bull committed what would be the first of many murders when he was only 25 years old. The victim was Joseph Colucci, a fellow Sparrow associate, but that didn't matter much to Gravano. He had been given an assignment and he was willing to go to any lengths to complete it. After successfully taking out Colucci, Gravano gained the respect of Carmine the Snake Persico, yet another notable member of the Colombo crime family. The positive attention and approval Gravano was receiving from the high-ranking men in the family did not go unnoticed and soon trouble was brewing. This growing tension finally manifested in the form of a rivalry between Gravano and Ralph Sparrow, the brother of Shorty. For the sake of peace, Gravano left the Colombo crime family and swore allegiance to another one of the five families, the Gambino crime family. As soon as he joined the Gambino family, Gravano's brutality and efficiency catapulted him into the limelight, and he quickly came to be known as a loyal and trusted family member. In 1976, when he was around 31 years old, Sammy the Bull was formally initiated into the Gambino family as a made man. Becoming a made man meant Gravano had more freedom than ever before within the organization. He became even more ruthless and had absolutely no aversion to turning to violence whenever the need arose. As his status grew within the organization, so did his responsibility. Soon, Gravano was taking part in the planning and execution of several high-profile murders, including the murder of Paul Castellano, the former Gambino boss. Castellano's murder was the first step in an elaborate plan that was hatched by Gravano, John Goody, Angelo Ruggiero, Frank DeSico, and Joseph Armoni to take over the helm of affairs of the family. The group disapproved of many of Castellano's decisions, and so they decided to take action. But Paul f***ed up. He made a lot, a lot of mistakes. I thought the, the world of him in the beginning. He lost my love through a series of events, and he lost the respect that Frankie had for him. After the group successfully took out Castellano in December 1985, Gotti was appointed as the new boss of the Gambino family, and Gravano, his trusted accomplice, was propelled up the family ladder. Under Gotti's rulership, Gravano went from captain to consigliere, effectively becoming the number three man within the entire organization. A little later down the line, he climbed up the ranks once again and became the family's underboss. For quite a while, Gotti and Gravano maintained a good working relationship and even friendship, despite the fact that Gravano had been skeptical about Gotti assuming the boss position, he completed his assignments dutifully. On more than one occasion, he even resorted to using underhanded tactics to keep Gotti out of jail after charges were brought against him. Things, however, turned sour between the pair when Gotti allegedly began to grow jealous of the profitability of Gravano's legitimate business ventures and wary of his popularity among the Gambino men. Sometime in 1988, Gotti, in an attempt to maintain a firm grasp on his power, mandated his capos to meet with him at the Ravenite social club once a week. Unknown to him, this was the first in a series of bad decisions that brought about his undoing. At this time, law enforcement agents had been investigating the mafia very closely with progressive leads, and somehow they had managed to place bugs in certain places where mob members were known to have meetings. One of such places was the Ravenite Social Club, and as you would expect, the bugs recorded several incriminating conversations. Having gathered sufficient evidence, FBI agents and NYPD detectives raided the social club in December 1990. During during the raid, Gravano, Gotti, and a few of their associates were arrested. Gravano pleaded guilty to a superseding racketeering charge, and Gotti was charged with five murders, conspiracy to murder, loan sharking, illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, bribery, 
and tax evasion. Things weren't looking good for Gotti and Gravano, and aside from being damning evidence, the tapes also created a rift between the two former allies. Gotti hatched a plan to make Gravano his fall guy by portraying him as the evil mastermind who orchestrated their crimes and schemes, and when Gravano learned of this, he was horrified. And I realized that John probably eventually would take me out for no other reason but he wants one show, one boss. Feeling betrayed and desperate to save himself, Gravano agreed to testify against Gotti and the mob in exchange for leniency. After the deal was made, Gravano officially became the first member of the hierarchy of a New York crime family to turn state witness and the second confessed underboss in the history of the American Mafia to do so. Gravano's testimony combined with the evidence against Gotti meant that he didn't stand a chance in court. He eventually received a life sentence without the possibility of parole and a $250,000 fine. In line with the stipulations of his deal, Gravano received a reduced sentence and was released sometime in 1994. Although Gravano still wound up in jail again for drug-related activities towards the end of that decade, he never returned to the Mafia. Instead, he channeled his energy toward writing books and sharing the details of his time in the mob. By all accounts, Gravano can be considered a lucky man, as he is one of the few people who snitched on the mob and didn't pay the ultimate price. He is living proof that it's possible to get out of the mob somewhat unscathed, but not everyone is that lucky. Spread across history are a number of other mob members who snitched like Joseph Joe Cargo Valachi and Joseph Stazzi Morelli and they have all met similar fates. The few who are lucky enough to escape the vengeful wrath of the mob spend the rest of their lives looking over their shoulders in fear. Only a few men like Salvatore Gravano can truly say they snitched on the mob with almost no repercussions. The mafia world is indeed dangerous for both made men and good citizens alike. More of these dangers are revealed in the next video you see on your screen. Click on it to find out more happening in the underbelly of crime.